I want you to open your Bibles, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2, and we're going to read verses 7 through 10. 2 Timothy 2, verses 7 through 10. Paul writes, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead, according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul writes that the gospel uh, he was preaching was the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, according to his summary in verse 8, and that doing that had brought him much trouble, and he was considered to be an evildoer for preaching it, according to verse 9, especially by his fellow Jews, who he had almost impossible uh, hopes of persuading to Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Romans 10, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all them that obey him. And, uh, but they had a hard time embracing that. And he had a very difficult time persuading them of that. And he says in verse 10 that if God had called him to suffer hardship and uh, even arrest, for Christ's sake, then so be it, if it would result in the salvation of others, who he calls the elect, there in verse uh, uh, 9, or verse 10. And he adds in verse 9 that although he was bound in a Roman jail, he says, but the word of God is not bound. And that's what I want to preach to you about today. My title is drawn from that phrase, the word of God is not bound. First of all, the word of God is not bound by time. You know, how matter, no matter how much time goes by, how much history unfolds, the word of God never goes out of date. It never becomes obsolete and archaic and irrelevant. It's more relevant and more necessary today than ever before. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. When Solomon writes, righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, Proverbs 14, 34, those words are just as appropriate today as they were when he first wrote them. Even more so, I would submit. And um, the main ordinance we practice as a body together, the Lord's Supper, is still pertinent, still relevant for us today, still valid and important. Paul wrote, as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. That is, every time we partake of it, every time we observe the Lord's Supper, we are uh, showing that his death was sufficient to cover our sins. It was shed, his blood was shed, his death took place for the sake of our sins. And until he comes again and tells us otherwise, uh, there is no other way to be saved except through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But this book can't go out of date yet because most of the Bible prophecy given hasn't been fulfilled yet. So the Bible can't go out of date yet, uh, nor will it ever. But the word of God is not bound by time. Secondly, let me say this. The word of God is not bound by age. The Bible isn't just a book for, uh, you know, exciting stories and tales of adventure to tell children in Sunday school for 45 minutes or an hour every Sunday. Nor is it a book just for old people to, who miss their youth and longing for their glory days 
looking, you know, they talk about older folks reading the Bible. They're cramming for their finals, right? They're getting ready for their final exam and jokes like that. The Bible isn't a, a book uh, geared specifically to certain age groups, but everything in it is uh, pertinent for everyone of every age to learn and discern and understand and comprehend. Um, just because the country has gone to heck in a handbasket around you doesn't mean the Word of God is uh, no longer relevant, no longer pertinent, no longer uh, necessary for a society to be reading. If the Word of God says, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, that doesn't have a particular age limit on it. Lying is always wrong. If the Word of God says, thou shalt not steal, that also isn't limited only to a certain age group. It's wrong to take what doesn't belong to you. And if the Bible says, uh, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths, anybody of any age ought to be able to take that and apply it to their own life. That's not just something for grandpa and grandma to pay attention to, and that's not just something for someone in uh, high school or college who's getting ready for their career. That's something every kid in America, every kid in Sunday school, no matter what age, should be able to embrace and to be able to grab a hold of. But it applies to everyone, regardless of age. The Bible tells us, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise, Matthew 21, 16. And then Christ said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Mark 10, 14. And then later Paul reminds Timothy that from a child, so he's a young man now, thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 3, 15. And we read in the book of Psalms, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Psalm 92, verse 14. Um, let me tell you the story that you've heard me tell before about a man named Lucius... A. Eddy, E-D-D-Y. Mr. Eddy was the president of the First National Bank in New York City back in the 1920s, along the, around the time of the Great Depression. Um, and Mr. Eddy was 75 years old and an unsaved man. But someone persuaded him to go and hear Billy Sunday preach in one of his revivals. And Mr. Eddy hit the sawdust trail that they used to cover the ground with to absorb sound. He hit the sawdust trail and walked to the stage to shake Billy Sunday's hand as a new believer in Jesus Christ. Other businessmen cheered when they saw Mr. Eddy going forward. Mr. Eddy lived another 17 years and died at age 92. And from the age of 75 to age 92, it's estimated that Mr. Eddy led over 1,000 men to Jesus Christ. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. And um, so the word of God is not bound or restricted to certain ages. Find something to do for God and get busy doing it, no matter what age you are. Thirdly, let me say the word of God is not bound by gender. Right Nowadays, you've got people who don't know what gender they are. There are only two. There's not three. There's not five. There's not seven. There's not 56 are all these different identification codes. You're a jerk. You've got a mental problem. And, and if you don't know whether you're a man or a woman, I would submit you've got some serious problems that I can't solve right now for you. We, we don't have time to go into your problems right now. But uh, the word of God is not bound by gender. The Bible's not a handbook on how to become a male chauvinist. The book establishes and it teaches what the roles of men and women are supposed to be before God. And the problem is in the hearts of people who don't want to accept it. They don't want to embrace it. They don't want to admit that God's word is right. There is a certain role and a function that they have in the world as a man or a woman, and they're never going to be happy unless they seek to fulfill that role. But the word of God shows men what their duties are as husbands, as fathers of children, as the head of their household, and, so, and it offers the, the best roles for women to emulate uh, as the 
keepers of the home, as the nurture, primary nurturers of children at home. Now, certainly, some men have had to become both father and mother to their children. When there was no wife, the wife either left uh, or died. And likewise, women have had to be father and mother when there was no husband or father left in the home. And some of the greatest Christian workers and in missionary work, in fact, have been women. Some of the most loyal supporters of a local church tend to always be women. Women seem to always outnumber men when it comes to supporting the work of the local church. It shouldn't be that way. And God's people, Bible-believing people, ought to set an example that both men and women support the local work. But generally speaking, um, women have been greater supporters of a local church and the local fellowship of other believers than men have been. But the Bible is not uh, bound by gender. It doesn't steer one direction or the other to tell uh, men to dominate and lord over their wives, uh, nor does it instruct wives to dominate and lord over their husbands. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. That's a tall responsibility for a man to fulfill, to look after his wife, to protect her and the children underneath them both, and to care for their welfare, to watch out for their spiritual concerns, to steer them away from temptation and, and uh, problems, if at all possible, and to educate them in the ways and the, the things of God, teach them the New Testament, teach them the Bible stories, teach them the Old Testament. You know, some of the great, uh, greatest exciting stories, uh, rather, the most exciting stories in the world come right out of the Old Testament. What boy, what young boy hasn't gotten excited at the story of David slaughtering Goliath with a slingshot. But and the great battles of Israel fighting against the Philistines, etc. And some of the, the, the faithfulness of great kings in the kingdom of Judah who worshiped the Lord God and sought only to please him. But um, but the Bible doesn't set out to try and elevate men as the lords and dominators of women, uh, that men are the only ones worthy of God's recognition or God's attention or God's blessing. We read in the book of Acts chapter 17, verse 4, it says, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But then later in Acts 17, verse 12, we read, therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Both men and women uh, need to turn to Jesus Christ, need to love the Lord God, need to love the word of God, need to seek, need to, seek to read and memorize the word of God and live out the commands and the, the uh, uh, ordinances and things listed for them in the New Testament. Point number four, the word of God is not bound by race. What do I mean by that? Well, the Bible isn't a textbook on racial supremacy. Uh, the white skinheads, the Aryan nation, the Ku Klux Klan, and uh, anyone else. My daughter sent me a little, I guess it's, it's not really a meme but because it wasn't a loop, but it was a picture on the internet, the, the Power Rangers, and the blue ones yelling, blue power, the green ones yelling, green power, the red ones yelling, red power, and the white one's yelling, hi there. <laughs> you, don't dare, you don't dare say white power, right? right. But, uh, so, so, but the word of God isn't intended to set up whites against everybody else or uh, black Muslims against everybody else. Do you know if there was ever one race in the Bible which had God's particular blessing upon it, and who God wanted to elevate above all the others, it wouldn't be white Europeans, it'd be the Jew. Amen. And God is going to do that, by the way, one day when the Lord Jesus comes back. But um, it teaches all men what their places are in the world among all the other races around them. The Bible says that God, quote, hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, 
that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Acts 17, verses 26 and 27. The general principle, the general rule of the scriptures is that God divided the races. And for his own pleasure, and uh, the black races dominate, have the entire African continent. The white European races have the, all the uh, isles and the countries of Europe. And the Shemitic peoples have all of the, far e the, the Near East, the Middle East, and the Far East, from the land of Israel all the way over as far as China and Japan. And uh, as a general rule, races tend to be separated and they keep themselves separated because they have similar backgrounds, similar cultures, similar histories, similar uh, stories of their ancestors and so forth. And there's nothing wrong with that. God blesses us uh, as he sees fit to mix a Korean congregation and a mostly white uh, Anglo congregation. And there, now there's one little caveat you have to add. There are no hard and fast rules in the New Testament about keeping the races separate. It becomes sort of a matter of common sense that generally speaking, people like to be with other people who are like them. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the problem is the people who think there's something wrong with it. They've got a screw loose in their head. But uh, the word of God's not set up to pit one race against the other. Um, God uses all races to reach all kinds of people. Do you know that every writer throughout the Bible was a Jew? a Shemite from the descendant of Noah's son, Shem. And yet most of the missionary efforts over the last 2,000 years have been conducted by Japhethites, Europeans. There's uh, some quirk in the, in the genetic makeup of white people. They like to travel. They like to go places. That's why the white man invented the telegraph, the automobile, the radio, satellite technology, satellite transmission, and uh, the um, space shuttle, spacecraft, the Apollo craft, the jet engine, and just about every other means of transportation and communication. For some crazy reason, white people like to go places. I'm an exception. When I have a vacation week, I'm just happy to stay home and not have to go to work, right? But white people like to travel, and, and those things can be laid at the, the doorstep, the credit of the white race as a general rule, ships and exploration ships, um, and uh, the Dutch sailing ships, Spanish galleons, but all around the world. Do you realize that by the end of the 1400s, before 1500, white explorers from Spain and even some from Germany and, uh, and the Dutch had almost the entire planet mapped out, almost every continent was mapped out before 1500 because white people couldn't sit still. And then when God gave the world the King James Bible in 1611, the, the British Empire really began to expand through the 1600s and 1700s until there was not a one single time zone around the world that, you, that didn't have some British colony in it. That's why they would say the sun never sets on the British Empire. And God used the natural desire to go places and put the Bible into the hands of white folks, and they went all around the world preaching it. Now, this country, the United States, which uh, proportionally has sent out more foreign missionaries abroad than any other nation, this country is in need of missionaries. That's the state this country's in. And uh, so thank God for uh, Korean Bible believers who are preaching the word of God to Koreans living here in the U.S. Because if you were left up to white Americans, and lazy white Christians, it probably wouldn't get done any longer. So thank the Lord for that. But the Bible is not bound by race. Not only did white men set about as missionaries, but some of the greatest preachers I've ever heard in my life were black brothers. I mean that. They can mine out illustrations from the scriptures like nobody's business. And um, I hear them preach from time to time and 
I said, man, that's good. I, I enjoyed hearing that. That was a real blessing to hear it. And they can reach the heart and the emotions of people. Uh, they know their people better than, than anyone else does. And they can reach the heart and the emotions of people far better than some white uh, honky getting up there trying to uh, impress them. Uh, and it don't work that way. Some of the best sermons I've ever heard have been preached by black preachers. If the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that's not race specific. That's everybody. Right. And the Bible is, uh, applies regardless of time, age, gender, or race. So the word of God is not bound by race. Let me move on next. Point number five in my outline. The word of God is not bound by culture. <clears throat> no matter what country or nation or language or government someone lives under, uh, when the Bible says the wages of sin is death, when the Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, when the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that applies to everybody. It doesn't matter if you live under a democracy or republic uh, or a socialistic communist government, but uh, no matter what form of government you live under, no matter what national religion uh, dominates that country, whether you're in an Islamic country, whether you're in the state of Israel, where uh, Judaism is, is uh, uh, taught and uh, encouraged and endorsed as the religion of the government, or you're living anywhere else in the world, doesn't matter where you live, if the Bible says all have sinned and that the wages of sin is death, that applies to you. You can't escape it. You can't escape the reality of that just because you say, well, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Hindu, I'm a Buddhist, I don't believe in those things. doesn't matter. You can say, I don't believe in gravity. still applies to you. Even someone who's never read the Bible or heard the gospel preached, he has a guilty conscience about the things that he's done. And the word of God declares his guilt in print on the pages of God's book. Uh, and now, he's, once he sees it, he has to do something about that. He knew he was guilty. He knew that there were certain things he shouldn't have done, but looking both ways, he decided to try and get away with it anyway. And now he's gotten away with it. He still wrestles with a guilty conscience. And when someone shows him the Bible and says, God's word actually says, thou shalt not do this, that, or the other, he sees it written in print that God's pretty much codified. Everything was buzzing around in his conscience anyway. He knew he was wrong. He knew he was guilty. And the word of God only uh, intensifies that. What if someone says, well, not every culture believes the Bible or some cultures believe in reincarnation. What makes you think you're right and what makes you think everyone else is wrong? Well, I could offer the illustration of uh, just about any building where there's only one main entrance and one main exit. The, someone who builds a building doesn't build multiple doors for people of different political persuasions to enter into or different religious persuasions to enter into. There's one entrance, one exit. That's pretty much the way everything in life works. God has one way to be saved, and the word of God is not bound by culture. And lastly, point number six today <clears throat> the word of god is not bound by the will of men the will of men the bible declares but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of god even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of god john 1 verses 12 and 13 the bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for correction, for reproof, for, for instruction in righteousness, that the word of God may be, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works, 2 Timothy 3.16. It's God who saves souls. It's God who communicates to us through his word. Uh, neither salvation nor the scriptures are the works of men. They are the fruit. They are the products of God. Therefore, no device of man no invention of man, no um, ul ulterior motive of man can keep the scriptures out. There's not a communist government in the world that can keep the Bible out of its nation if God chooses to put it in there. Not a single one. I have a Bible right here. 
published by Hendrickson Bible Publishers, Peabody, Massachusetts, published in China. You say, well, why would, how in the world could that happen? Well, I'll tell you how it could happen. When the love of money is the root of all evil, the Bible says, and the love of money is also the motivation behind a lot of political governments. And China trying to compete in the world's stage and producing just about everything Americans buy. Remember Toys R Us? We went out of business now, but you'd go through Toys R Us and not a single item on the, on the store that wasn't made in China. But, uh, I mean, thank God for the Chinese who help our kids enjoy Christmas, right? <laughs> but... But that, that country trying to compete with the world uh, has loosened the rules here and there so they can produce and manufacture and, and uh, uh, create just about everything that's in demand around the rest of the world, including Bibles. Now, the, one, the wonderful thing about it, the way God works, is you know good and well, and I've said this to you before, that undoubtedly some worker at that printing plant in China takes some of his work home because he wants to bone up on his English and he ends up getting the word of God, saturating his soul by reading it at home. God has little sneaky tricks up his sleeve as well. So you think you're keeping it out. You're not keeping it out. Uh, uh, Tom White uh, came and spoke at our church, oh, probably 25, 30 years ago now. He, was, he and another man were flying over uh, Cuba in a small craft. And, uh, well, let well, me back up before that. He was burdened about getting the gospel to Cuba, 90 miles off the coast of Florida, communist nation under Castro. And so he put tracks in these little, gospel, these little flotation bags and tried to figure out the, the, the flow of the tides between Florida and Cuba as best as he could. And on faith, he just went to the ocean, threw hundreds of these things in the ocean, hoping that the waters would eventually take him to the shores of Cuba. Sometime later, he and a friend were flying in that part of the, the Gulf and had engine trouble, had to make an emergency landing in Cuba. They didn't have time to fly all the way back to Florida. They landed in Cuba, of course, were immediately arrested for trespassing and so forth. And they got into the, the Cuban jail. And he said in the third level of lockup, there were men reading the tracks that he had right. sent. Brother Andrew, God's smuggler in Romania back in the 60s during the Cold War, he pulled up to a checkpoint to go into Romania. He was driving one of those old VW bugs where the trunk was in the front, you know, and the trunk was, was filled with Bibles. The front seat and the floorboard were covered with Bibles. The back seat and the floor in the back were covered with Bibles, hundreds and hundreds of Bibles. And he'd get up at the checkpoint right before he went, uh, crossed over. He'd pray and say, God, in your word, you made blind eyes to see. I'm asking that now you would make seeing eyes to be blind. And he'd pull up, show them his paperwork and his passport. They'd walk around, look in the windows, inspect the car, and not seem to notice one single Bible in the car. And he'd drive on through take hundreds and hundreds of Bibles. He said this happened more than once. And so there's not, a, there's not a, uh, an effort of man that can keep the word of God out if God wants it to get in. Amen. So the word of God is not bound by the will of man. And I'm going to try to b begin to close. As a King James Bible believer, I, I know the word of God is not bound by the will of man. You know that there are about 18 million books in the U.S. Library of Congress, but only one with no copyright. If God were going to give the words, his words to men in a form that they could have 100% absolute confidence in, never have to change a word or question a single word in it, who would be qualified or worthy to control the copyright to it? Some individual Christian, some committee, 
some board of directors perhaps somewhere? Who would be responsible enough to control the copyright to it? And yet there is no copyright on the King James text. Anyone can print it, uh, reprint it anytime, any place, anywhere, and you don't need permission from anyone. And yet the, the words of the Bible still remain virtually unchanged. You have dozens of companies, publishing companies, all printing the King James Bible. And the text remains pretty consistent throughout all those country, the companies. You say, well, how does that happen? Well, because human envy gets involved. God uses the weaknesses of the flesh to accomplish his work if he needs to. <clears throat> if one company said, well, we need to adjust the spelling on some of those Old Testament names. We need to adjust the pronunciation markings and so forth. Uh, some other company would become self-righteous and uh, start advertising. Well, you see, that company changed the beautiful King James language. You can trust our company to always produce exactly what the author is intended. So they use greed and envy and, and competition against each other in order to keep the words of God the way God wants it to be. Amen. Thank God for that. But the revised version, the American Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, the NIV, the New King James Bible, the Living Bible, the New Living Translation, and anything else with the word new on it is not new at all. But every single one of those Bibles depends on a copyright. They depend on someone controlling the printing and the distribution of those Bibles. Not so with our book. Not so with God's book. Isaiah 42, verse 8 says, I am the Lord. That is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Uh, the word of God is not bound by time, age, gender, race, culture, or the will of man. 